Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 182, for Monday, September 17th, 2018. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast, yep, by Foreign About working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Kent, on this beautiful Monday? Pretty good. It feels like fall is here. We just, we had a gig. We we had a gig. uh, We had a couple gigs Friday and Saturday, and it kind of felt like the end of the summer by doing those gigs. It Mm. kind of felt like we've wrapped up our summer tour and, you know, house rockers have a couple weeks off, which we haven't had a couple weeks off since May. And it just kind of felt like closure. And, you know, we got a couple guys going on some nice long vacations that they put off and didn't do over the summer. So it just kind of feels like we wrapped up the summer this past weekend. How about nice. you? How's it going? Uh, yeah, we had our resurgence of summer this uh, this weekend. It was in the 80s and 90s and, Ooh. you know, 100 percent humidity. Like, it's weird to see 100 percent humidity when it's not raining. But yet that's what it listed all weekend. Um, we had our our first tastes of fall. Really, they began over Labor Day for us. It was it was relatively cool here. But uh, but yeah, we were back to sweltering and you know closing up the windows and turning back turning the AC back on. All weekend. crazy man. Yeah, we usually get an Indian summer. You know, September is usually actually quite warm. Yeah, and you know, for people who don't know the San Francisco Bay Area, so San Francisco is usually socked in with fog all summer long. But as soon as it gets to September, it's usually the best year, the best month of the year to visit San Francisco. It's usually the clearest. Right, and um. But uh, we haven't had a real shot of Indian summer. It's kind of like settling down into mid to low seventies on its way south. And huh. so I don't know. I don't know if it'll come about because I still have a couple outdoor gigs to do. But um, yeah, it just feels like it's kind of easy. You know, the kids are back in school. Yep. and You know, football's on TV, and yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's fall. Yeah, it is weird. Uh, you know, turning the AC on and uh, and and watching football for us here. If we're going to watch football, like most of the season. It's, you know, we're going to spend whatever, three, four hours in the living room. So we'll light a fire and all that stuff. And we were watching a game w- with the kids yesterday. And uh, and I, I joked to my wife, I'm like, oh, so we should light a fire. And she's like, uh, no, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's 90 degrees. Yeah, <laughs> it's 90 degrees. And we've got the AC running. I'm like, yeah, well, that's fine. The AC will keep it cool. We'll have a fire for ambiance. No, yeah. not, not good. Uh, I had a gig on Friday that. I really went out of my way to not go out of my way to tell anybody about, um, because I was, I, I, and I, I, I only realized this in retrospect, right? It, I woke up Friday morning and was not quite panicked, but anxious and couldn't figure out off the, you know, right off the bat, I couldn't figure out what it was. I'm like, what, like, what am I freaked out about today? And I realized it was this gig because it was an acoustic duo. And I've done acoustic duos before, you know, I'd play them with, I did one with you. Uh, I do them all the time with Amanda, but uh, John Donahue, Johnny D, the singer in Monkey Fist and Chafed when Chafed plays, uh, he and I were, did a duo on Friday night and we've never done a duo before. We've always had another guitar player with us, uh, usually this guy, Jimmy, but uh, but we've brought others. and uh, And so this one was just he and I, and he's... He's a decent guitar player, but he's relatively new to the world. You know, in the last year was the first time he did a, uh, you know, a a gig where he was the chief guitar player. And he's done, I think, one or two solo gigs. But um, but it was interesting. And I knew that I was going to have to, you know, be more aware and more cognizant. And also I knew I was going to wind up playing guitar uh, for quite a bit. Not quite a bit, but, you know, two or three songs a set kind of thing to uh, help kind of, you know, fill in the tunes and bring it along and and give Johnny D a break and all that stuff. So uh, so I was anxious going into it. But as as we've said many times going into a gig, if I have to choose whether I'm going into a gig anxious or comfortable, a little bit of anxious is good. Right. Too comfortable. And you wind up 
you know, getting cocky and, and it's bad. Mm. Right. It, you know, but uh, but this one, I mean, there were some specific reasons to be anxious, like, oh, are we going to be able to like we I didn't know. Are we going to be able to do this? Right. We had one rehearsal with this concept six months ago or something, and it didn't go all that well. And so like that probably fit into my you know basis of concern here, but it went great. The gig uh, was went really well. It was not perfect. No one in the club other than uh, John and I knew that because that's how it works. And we had a blast and harmonies locked in and we had some really nice moments and looked at each other, really looked at each other about halfway through and we're like, okay, so this is a thing. We can do this. We don't need to worry about it if we can't bring, you know, Jimmy or Maddie or Russ or whatever with us. It's like, yep, this is a thing. We can do it. And and it will be 10 times better the next time we do it because we've already learned the lessons that we need. And one of them I already knew. We did not write a set list. We had a song list, uh, which is how monkey fist gigs usually go. But we definitely should have written a set list for this. Mm. Not that we had a problem with it. it. I mean, the evening flowed fine, but it's just that extra stress of, oh, crap, like in the moment now we need to think about all these other things. Plus what songs next, you know, and, and we could have easily time shifted that responsibility and and freed ourselves from that stress in the middle of the gig. So I have two thoughts on that. So yeah. Acoustic Madness you know, as a trio and the way we typically do things is like, we just keep going around and around and around. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Sure. What, what do you want to do? So, you know, your time is coming around mm. and you kind of are thinking a little bit ahead because you don't want to interrupt the flow too terribly bad. And and so, so we have, you know, we know our songs, you know, we know our, our total pool of songs. Sure. And sometimes we'll request a song when it comes to my turn, uh, there might be something I really would, would like to hear Mary Ellen sing. And so, you know, I'll use my spot to request one for hers and, and the others will do the same. And, you know, the night just kind of flows in a nice way that way. And then we have certain songs that are, are, you know, three piece harmony all the way through, you know, seven bridges road type of stuff. Sure. And we'll just kind of play those when we play those. But, but when I do my solo acoustics, I've tried it both ways and having a set list I never will follow it. It, it gives you sure. a, a, a it gives you a plan, but then you know the nice thing about the solo stuff and and even the duo stuff I do with Simon is you have a list of songs there where because if you have to think about you know what what am I prepared to play then oh, you kind of no no your no. brain goes off into the sky but yeah you no know, having I think a, I think a song list is good and I guess a set list can be useful that it could always bail you out and well that's and the keep to me going. that's the beauty of the set list is it is it, you know when inspiration does not strike you already have an idea right that's yes. that's the beauty of it and and again just in the moment and the flow of it all with the, the, you know, the added stress of, wow, here we are. And this is a new thing in a sense, like having that set list probably would have been a good idea. In fact, yeah. definitely for us, you know, in that moment, but yeah, otherwise we like with Amanda or with, with um, even with monkey fist as a trio, we don't, we don't do the set list. I do like the thing that, that you described where it's sort of, you know, goes around the horn and makes it interactive a little yeah. bit. People know who the next one is to pick a song, that kind of thing. I like that. Yeah. yeah. And Steve being Steve, you know, when it comes around to him, he'll often use his spot to say, does anybody have a request? Sure. And so then he'll go out and, you know, and then anything weird and wild can do. It also depends if, uh, if the focus is on you or whether your background music, if you, if your background music, there's a lot less pressure to come up with a, a song in the moment. Yes. But you know, I, I guess always having a plan is good unless you're that type that really is comfortable keeping all that in your mind and, you know, keeping your plan in your mind. Right. And then you can, you can go for that. But I, you know, I've done it all three ways, no plan at all. And I definitely am keenly aware of those moments where like, how can I not think of a song to play? Right? You know, yeah, like, right. I've got right. 200 songs, you know, why am I not thinking of one? Yeah. And then I've, I've, I've had set lists, which I, you know, detour from routinely. Sure. And then song lists is, but even the song list, you kind of got to scan them. Did I already play that? And so, you know, that's, just that some, was the problem. And, and it was also, you know, we had, we're, we're used to the song list that monkey fist has with Jimmy playing guitar. And so a lot of that was on our list there, but there was a lot of that that was not doable with, with just the two of us. 
And in addition to that, there were, you know, probably another, whatever, 20 songs that we never do with Jimmy that, that John's comfortable playing and, and either him singing or me singing. And, and so we had those. So this was a, this was not a, uh, you know, put on your old comfortable pair of slippers and play, you know, this gig that, you know, there were a lot of unknowns and it was, you know, you'd look at the set list and, or the song list rather, and see a song and be like, oh, that's great. And then you have to stop and think, well, you know, we're only halfway through the first set. Do I want to burn that yeah. tune now? Yeah. Right. You know, and so for, for that reason, there was just way too much thought process because we haven't done it 15 times or even five times. And we don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as long as we save, you know, these t these three for that set, then we're fine. We can, you know, sort of use those as anchors and build around them. Like there, there's there's just none of that experience. Uh, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate to understand that there's something about the immediacy and the intimacy of the immediacy of making those decisions. So you, you pull a, you pull a can't miss song into the first set that you were planning to hold in a second, mm -hmm. kind of in your mind, you're like, all right, I got to make this work in the second set. And all of a sudden you find a song you that you thought was a six or a seven now becomes an eight or a nine because you had to make it an eight or a nine. Yep. And so there, you know, I, I just find there's all sorts of really interesting learnings in when they, especially when I do it solo, cause it's all me. Right. right. So you know, really focused, but you know, not, not a long, long leap to the, the feeling when I do a duo or a trio is that, you know, the song selections mostly flow. I, and I would actually say, Going back to what you started with, a little bit of edge is what you would prefer. Yes. I would hasten to say that just that approach at all probably is going to keep you from ever having a train wreck of a night because you're, you're just focused on, on finding the details that will get you through the gig in it's a more true. effective way. It forces you to be present. You, Present. Yeah. yeah. Right. Present. You know, you're not just yeah. following a, a script and like, all right, that's the next song. That was the last song. Here we go. Okay, thanks. We're going to take a break. All right. Now we're back. Right. Y you know, there's there's definitely. Yeah, you're in it. And 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 that can be fun. And and of course, John and I have spent, you know, many, many hours on stage together. And so the the not only the banter between us, but the inclusiveness of that banter to bring everybody in is natural for us. I think it's probably natural for us anyway. And, and we've done it together a lot. So even if we were, you know, sort of fishing for the next tune, we could have that conversation in an entertaining, hopefully entertaining and, and public way to, to, to bring everybody in as opposed to wait, what are they up to? How come they're not playing? Like it was, there was never dead air, which is good, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, here, here's an interesting question for you. And I, in Acoustic Madness, we've been doing, we've been playing for four years, and I'd say 60% of what we do has been the same for four years. Mm -hmm. And a little bit has come in, and then we do take some some requests. And the concept of people who come to see you wanting to hear that thing that you do that they like, how important is it to keep it fresh and moving over I am right now of the mind that when you have a set that works, you can actually mind that for longer than you would think. And that the desire to keep things fresh is often more to keep the musician engaged with his own material than it is to really, you know, I, I think the audience likes what they like. I agree and with they that. They don't see you every night. And, you know, most, most touring groups, you know, they play, you know, take fish aside and, you know, many things they're playing the same show, you know, every night, a two hour show every night and you yep. go do it. You're in Vegas. You play the same show every night. And if people come to see it multiple times, I, I would question the number of people who come to see you so often that you would make set list decisions based upon that sample size. Do you agree? I do. Yeah. I you know. I, I think you were spot on that the keeping it fresh is more for the musicians. There's some level of that, obviously, that makes sense for the, you know, for the crowd, especially if you have regulars. But th I think the way to manage that is, you know, it, if you're in the middle of a gig and even if you're playing cover tunes, right, you know, and you say, oh, I've got something new for you. Unless you know it's a hit, it's probably not going to be a hit the first time, right? With mm. with the crowd of people that know you, right? Because they can't, like you said, they left their house, they got off the couch, they put on shoes, and they came out to see the thing that they know. Right. Um, 
What I have found, and and as we're having this conversation, I'm realizing, oh, there's a better way to leverage this. What I have found is my family, uh, especially my daughter and my wife, they hear the conversations about, oh, we've been working on this tune or that tune. So they start getting excited about hearing this new tune before it's ever there. And, and they are eager for it. And now that I'm sort of processing this while we're doing the show, it's obvious that the right thing to do would be to, you know, post maybe on Facebook or something like, Hey, we've been working on new tunes. Here's three new songs that we've got in the list. And that way, when people come, even though it's a new thing, it's familiar to them, right? They're, that you might even be able to whet their appetite a little bit. Like, oh, cool. Like, this is now a thing and I'm part of it. And it's it's my thing now, not that thing that they do that they're trying to force on me. You know what I mean? Like, so, Well, actually, it's interesting. So in this age of social media, there's there's an interesting twist to that. So when we were kids going to concerts and even now, you know, what are they going to play? What are they going to play yeah. when you go see your favorite bands? That's part of the excitement of it. But is it? But I mean, most people look up it? the set list on set list FM. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so would you, is it, is it next generation set list making by, you know, audience crowdsourcing your set list? Oh yeah. I, th- I definitely think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know whenever I go see shows with my kids, they want to know what songs are going to be played. They don't want to know the order, which is interesting. It's like, so there's some element of surprise and, and delight that is good, but uh, for the most part, and you might even be able to say like, they don't necessarily need to know the whole set list. Right. But it, you know, it, there's, there's that 70% mark. It's like, yeah, I want to, I want to know what, what to expect here. And then, and then, you know, that's fine from there on. But it's fine. Just, just extract it out. And you know, you, it's a social media exercise. Okay. Yeah. You know, you, you're trying to build your audience and so get them involved with what you do, which is, you know, fairly marketing one-on-one type of thing. Right. So, yep. so, you know, Hey, you know, you choose the set list, you know, the top 10 songs you guys choose, you know, will definitely be played. We have three surprise slots for you that we're not going to tell you, but you're going to want to see them, you know, and we'll see how you liked them afterwards. And, you know, it's, so that's it's, that's a different, interesting that's a thing. different, it's, I mean, it's, we're, you know, it's all in this social media realm, but that's different than telling people what they're going to hear. Right. And I'm, I've done, I've tried that the pick the songs. People don't, I, I've, I've never had success with that. Mm. I, I, and so that's why I'm kind of now leaning towards, maybe we just tell them what we're working on and that gets people excited. And and now that I'm thinking about it, it's not just my family. Like I've had conversations with friends or whatever, like I've got, one friend that that loves to come out to see fling he's he's a friend of many of us in the band and he's a super like power pop f- f- geek right a big fan huge geek about power pop so when we were working on like tempted i i happened to mention to him like oh yeah you know next gig we'll probably have that and he showed up and was like, I want to hear Tempted, mm. you know, right? And it's like, oh, right. So all we need to do is just tell you what you're going to get a little bit, you know, and and maybe that's the trick. Because when you put it on people to vote for, you know, build the set list, I, I, I think there's you need to have a big enough engaged audience for that to be not a, you know, cricket level failure, right? Where it's like, we asked everybody and one person chimed in, Yeah, you, you know, it's like that, yeah, that's yeah, putting I too feel, much I pressure like out there. I don't, I don't know. That, that's how it's been for me when I've tried to do those kinds of things. It's like, oh, right. I think it depends on the, the nature of the rapport you have with your audience. If Definitely. you're interactive with your audience and they, you know, they talk to you a lot, then, then they'll talk to you. But if, you know, if it's people who don't know you that well, and they really just like your page or like mm. your Twitter feed, because they want to find out where you're playing, then then it's probably a, a fruitless exercise. But yes, um, <laughs> right, right, which is how it's been uh, the, the few times I've tried that. So I, this is, but this is good. This is like fuel for an experiment. So you folks experiment too, and if you've experimented and have either success or failure to share, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Definitely, we would love to. Uh, we'd love to hear of it. Yeah, there's a guy who comes to see the House Rockers quite a bit. Well, he's, he's, he's coming less now. We played when Chuck Berry passed away, we, 
we played C'est La Vie. You better, you, yeah. you, you never can tell. And um, it, it just lit him on fire. And But we only did it for a while. And we only did it, you know, for a short period of time to honor Chuck Berry. And then we put it away. And it wasn't never intended to be part of our long-term set list. But this guy comes a lot. And he, can, am I going to get it? And now, you know, we haven't we haven't reviewed the charts. I don't remember the words anymore. I mean, you know, there's a whole you know bunch of things. Yeah. And, you know, would you... Would you make a choice for one person who's very vocal about it? I've always had to say, oh man, we haven't, we, we only played that for a short period of time. And, you know, we haven't even thought about that song in a while. I do get requests for stuff we've played, you know, interesting ones. Saturday in the Park is, is one that, that we get quite a bit from Chicago, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's just weird. I mean, we get, we get, Various and sundry one-off requests that I don't think would be valuable to the whole audience. Maybe the Chuck Berry one you could do any time, but sure. But um, how, how much feedback do you need in order to make some some decisions? Yeah, that's tough. Um, and that's I, the risk of going out. Yeah. Because then, you, then you're setting yourself up to disappoint somebody if they actually do ask. Right, and and individually that doesn't matter. But if that becomes if that is your mo or or that becomes a habit then you will start to erode your audience away right by yeah. by setting this expectation that yes you're going to do this thing and then simply never doing it so yeah sure. that's that's tough I, yeah i don't know the magic answer to that one man that's um that's tough yeah you know um i, I have a well we have many more things to talk about but we did have a comment come in after the uh, penultimate show that we did, I believe that was number 180, where we were talking about uh, fans and bands and, and things like that. And uh, Dan wrote in and uh, when we were, and really we were talking about inappropriate fans. And Dan wrote in and said, guys, uh, there's a whole unfortunate gender thing to consider with this conversation, too. He says, I know several female performers who have save me signals set up with their bandmates to help them get out of situations where fans are being inappropriate. Like when fan meets, meets fanatic meets owner of some idea of how a relationship with a performer is supposed to go that's completely at odds with reality. As Dan continues, us dudes don't often confront the fact that there are lots of women who can't walk down the street without worrying about being assaulted or at least hassled. He says, put one up on stage doing something charismatic in a room full of drunk humans and the whole situation multiplies. <laughs> and he's right. Like that. I never I have certainly been in scenarios where I've been on stage, you know, with a woman uh, that has been the the subject of of exactly what Dan's describing here. And, and we've, you know, it, it's always worked out that one of us has realized it and, and, you know, we'll step in and, and just, you know, sort of circle the wagons and then everything's good. But, uh, the idea of having officially discussed signals of save me, or, you know, I need, I need involvement here, you know, don't so, leave me hanging out to dry. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so let's extract this a little bit because yes, it is a, a, a unique, set of circumstances when it involves a woman front person. And, and yep. I got to say, Mary Ellen has been asking to come on the show. I've been telling her I want her to come on the oh, show. Again. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking great. about the female's perspective mm. and she's been doing this since she was too young to sing in bars. You know, I think she was 16, you know, sure. when she was singing in bars in, in bands full of fully grown men and, you know, so internal band dynamics and audience. And, you know, she's just adorable and cute and amazing voice and really charming performer. So I'm sure she has a lot of, of, uh, experiences to share with that. But, you know, even as guys, we have had girls jump up on stage and absolutely flash audiences and grab audience members. And it, it, we had some, uh, women behaving a little bit badly at a gig on Saturday night so it's interesting that this is brought up because that process by what do you do when people behave badly? Again, what do you do when, a, when someone's behaving badly towards the woman in your band? That's a certain set of problems. Yeah, to solve. One dynamic. Yep. But in general, like, you know, when you're in a club, whose responsibility is it to keep people off the stage? Is it the clubs or is it the bands? And, do you, you know, do you, I, I've never had the conversation where when you have to call security and you don't want to call security over the over the mic and, and start a whole thing. No, it changes like the dynamic. Happen is, yeah. yeah. What you'd like to have happen is that, the you know, the club is doing their job and they'll just come and they'll they'll keep the the band protected because it's good for their audience as well. You know, one yeah. drunk girl on stage 
does nothing. Or one drunk guy on stage doesn't matter. Does nothing yep. for your show. <laughs> nope. You know, it's it's not like it gets everybody riled up and gets everybody excited. Like we're really having a crazy night tonight. That you know, I I just don't see that happening anymore. No. It just more puts a it's getting sloppy vibe on what's going on. That's it, yeah. That that's the best case scenario is that all it does is puts a it's getting sloppy vibe on. Yeah. Yeah, I I like this idea though of signals and and not just signals amongst the band to your point, a signal with the club so that you can ask them to take care of a thing that maybe they didn't notice, right? You know. Well, it's risky if it's the band because you know, the, you know there's less of a barrier to an audience member getting hostile with a band member than yes. with a security guy from the club. Yeah, that's true. I had, you know, a, a guy get up on stage one time, um, came right up next to me. And, and in the moment while I'm going through my list of options of what I might want to do, Steve, my bass player, who's a big guy, put a bass down, grabbed the guy forcibly and, you know, let him off stage. He wasn't going to let it happen, Ooh. which was cool that he did it. But again, you know, like like you and I knew from the gig that we did, you know, sometimes if it's a guy in the band saying no, it can it can go a different direction. Right. Yeah, for sure. So. Yeah. So what do you think is the right thing to do? do you, I mean, is it like someone in the band, you know, who who in the band volunteers to be that guy to be confrontational with a drunk person who gets on your stage? And is there, you know, cause not everybody has that personality and you can't ask somebody to do that if they're not comfortable doing it right? because it could, could escalate and get worse. Right. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, um, I don't know that there's a magic answer to this. I mean, it would be great to just punt and say, it's always the club it must always be the club. Right. And, and, in, and there's some, there's some basis to that, that, you know, if it's, especially if you are just playing at a club gig where the, the club has hired you and that's that. And yeah, man, like these are your patrons and you're the one with the liquor license and you're the one that has to manage. Are they too drunk to be here? Are they, you well, know, security usually stands at the door is what the problem is. Right. Right. right you know, of they're course. rarely, and there's yeah. a distance between the door and the stage and, and they're not paying so, attention to the stage. Right. right. So having, having, so, especially if it's a club where you know that this is a thing that could happen happen it might not be a bad idea like i i and i'm i'm thinking of specific clubs i've played where you know it's a mildly rougher cloud crowd than it might be at you know at others and you just like maybe having a conversation with the bouncer like hey you know if somebody gets on stage how do you want me to get your attention Mm, yeah, right. Maybe we have a code word, have you know, a code Mr. Word. Johnson or something like that. Yeah. Right. It, right. Right. That way you're not alerting the entire place to we need security. Right. Because because that in and of itself, like could make things a lot worse. If if you call for a bouncer and someone from the crowd feels like I've got you, homie. Right. Yeah. And they get on stage to try and solve your problem. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, it's, it's not, it's not going to get well, better. Again, yeah. Remember the vibe of the show. Whenever, whenever I've seen it happen at like a, a reasonably pro show. Yeah. Um, the performers are just the poor, innocent victims of having worked up their audience too much. And yep. they, they, they get to maintain that aspect of their vibe, the responsibility for the security. The, the performer is never the bad guy. I know in, in my situations, like I said, I, I kind of click through the list of options, depending upon who, who it is, how it's yeah. happening, yeah. who they're bothering on stage. You know, is it a guy? Is it a girl? Is it, a, is it a big guy or, you know, what's going on? And, um, I tend to be more, even though I'm the front person, of my band, I tend to be more, we're not going to allow this in the show. And, you know, people, I I'm comfortable communicating the vibe that I'm not cool with that. And it's not a good thing in the show. Right. It's going to affect those people who would think to do that. And that's I, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I think that that's okay. And I also think it's okay that hopefully I get the benefit of the doubt from the audience and I'm not just being a jerk. I'm just drawing I've, a line. What's, what's, what's right or wrong. It's, it's how you do it. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll wave a finger at somebody and say, no, 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 no. Or, I don't have any really clever thing to say to, to make everybody at ease with the situation and have the person at ease walk off the stage. I mean, it's always just such a weird thing, right? You know, it's, it's, it's someone drunk, they get on stage, they turn around, they wave at their friends, they, 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 you know, scream or dance or whatever. They try to get on mic sometimes. And if they try to get on mic, I'll definitely, you know, whisper something to them saying, this is not cool. Yeah. Right. Right. And then they'll look at me right. to see how serious I am. But, you know, if they go over and they're bothering one of the guys in the band because that's their favorite guy in the band, you know, 
I, it's an interesting discussion because I, I've never thought it through. I've thought through what I do, but it's really not systemized to like how we do it. So I, I really sure. like this idea of like, if this happens in your shows, do you have a, you know, a, a can, Mr., can Mr. Johnson come to the stage, please? And, yeah. you know, that's the code for the security guy to come up. Or, you know, is there someone in your band if the, if the venue doesn't want any part of putting their hands on one of their clients, which I can't imagine why, because they're responsible. Their but, job. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, how will the band handle it? You know, would you like remember what I did when that happened? I just stopped the song and I said, I we're not going to play. Until yeah. this person gets off stage, well, and trying and to turn was, the audience against the guy. That's the trick: is finding a way to, if not turn the audience against them, make this person feel like they are not they they are only representing themselves and not mm-hmm. representing the crowd. And I saw they might be giants a long time ago, uh, twenty five years ago or something, at Toad's place down in New Haven, and people were you know like slam dancing and moshing, and at one point they stopped and they're like. You know, you folks up here, you like they're like our our crowd, and they kind of pointed to everyone else in the club. They're like, our crowd doesn't do this. Like this is <laughs> this is a different thing, and they were sort of laughing about it, but they were also obviously highlighting it for the sake of saying to everyone else, like this isn't cool, and and this can you know this can go away if it has to, right? You, you know, no one was no one was getting hurt. It wasn't a terrible thing, but. Uh, but you know, they identified it. And so maybe if that person comes on stage employing a little bit of that, like, Hey man, that none of us, none of the rest of us here and just kind of gesturing to the whole audience, like none of the rest of us here want this. You, you need to get off stage. Right. And then that yeah, way, it, maybe you're maintaining that cool vibe with everyone else and not totally disrupting the show. I don't know. Well, what I'm hearing, it kind of goes back to this theme of of who are you and what type of a leader and what type mm. of a performer are you, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're not how do you communicate, you know, your 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 line in the sand about this type of stuff? Yeah. Right. You know, again, I think some bands are actually okay with it. You know, some bands it's, you know, part of their show, part of their vibe. You know, that's that's their how they know if they've gotten over with the band, if they've gotten someone to get so crazy that they do that. But, um, like I said, I try to just more kind of give visual, like shake my head and like, Nope, not tonight. This is, you know, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. you know, that. That's more my thing yeah. until it gets out of hand. And then I'll be like, you know, then I'll go over and I'll say something. You really got to get off the stage. So that's my approach to it. Yep. Someone in the audience might say, God, what a jerk. They're just having to have fun. I guess I'm, I guess I've made the calculated effort that I'm willing to, to risk that at the expense of the entertainment for everybody, you know, that right. type of thing. Right. But I think having a plan is a really good idea. It's a good and, idea. Know, yeah. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? You know, you know, are you going to address the audience? Are you going to go talk to the person directly? What's a tactic? What, what if you go say something to the person and they don't get off the stage? Then right. What are you gonna do? Yeah. And like then, I said, right. That night that it happened to us, when you and I were playing, I literally stopped the song and said, I'm not playing until this person gets off stage. My and hope was- still that didn't get off. Like it took yeah. them a while. But the oh, audience yeah. did be like, come on, let them play. You know, that, which was kind of what, you know, my- that was Again, the, yeah, I'm that was pretty authoritative in the way I run the band and the way I present the show. So it was my call to make that. And yep. I, I was leveraging my, my earned relationship with the audience to take that position. Because if you don't have that, you can look like a jerk. Totally. Yes, so, totally. Totally. And yeah. So, so I think it's a really great conversation. So how do you engage the club? How do you get help if you need help? And that's probably the best thing to do. First line of defense. If that's not an option or if it's not happening fast enough, what can you do? What can you control from the stage in a professional way? Again, you know, it's, it's easy enough to just grab the person and, you know, put them off stage or it's easy enough to, you know, bring the band down a little bit and, you know, put your arm around the person and say, Hey, we're really not about that. That might be your vibe. That might be your way to do it. I know my first reaction when this happens is like a boundary has been crossed and I'm, I'm uh, offended at the intrusion. Like yeah, I'm up here trying I to think give everything I, I can. If there, if there was a flaw in that, it's, it's outwardly communicating that offense, right? Yeah. Be, because, because that in and of itself can change the vibe, like better to just, I think better to, to try and, and keep that part in and then just say to the, to the room and also to this person, like, you're not us. 
And by but us, maybe there's a way to do it where you slide the band and you just be like, you know, without embarrassing the person. I guess that would probably be optimal if you could find a way to say, I am so flattered that we got you so worked up that you want to be on here doing it with us. We're going to do our own thing for a while. If you don't mind, just go back, hang with your friends, and we're going to continue the show. If there's some that's, essence that's of that That's the Dave message, Grohl approach right there. Exactly. That's why he's the mirror of rock and roll. Yeah, it is. It is. The that's things, why everybody loves him. The th- it is why everybody loves him, because he does exactly that. Like, I'm so flattered, but you can't be here. But without saying that, like, I'm so flattered, but we have a thing to do. So I need you to go back over there, and you rock out there. We'll rock out here, and that's how it's going to work. But what I see more often than not, and certainly our band has done this as well, is that you kind of get a little paralyzed as you go through the thought process. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't act. And, you, and then it goes on a little longer and then everybody's uncomfortable and then the person just kind of hops down. And yes. then, but that's not really. That's not what you want. You yeah. lost that moment of your show if you let that happen. Totally. You didn't you didn't own. You're trying to own every note that comes off that stage. And for a few seconds, you lost it or a minute or whatever it might be. Yeah. So why not have a plan? I really like that idea. That's good. It's good. Cool. So I've been going through a thing, changing gears. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm in addition to playing in bands, I run businesses and I've been a, uh, you know, I do some consulting work and like lots of different things. So, and I also, I have, uh, I believe a genetic flaw that predisposes me to actually like the law and accounting. So, uh, (laughs) so I'll just state that right up front. Yeah, I know. It's just me. Uh, there's this whole thing that the IRS, uh, has defining who is an employee and who is an independent contractor. And, and we'll talk through some of the specifics, but in a very general sense, the, the idea is asking who has control over how you do your job. Right. And, and, and that if the person paying the bill has, a certain level of control, then you are an employee. And the reason for that is that employees are treated differently, not only tax wise, but also in, you know, employees can unionize employees get the benefit of benefits. If there are benefits offered right to all employees, employees also get uh, covered by workers' compensation. Right. And, uh, and so a lot of times it's financially beneficial to a company not to call you an employee, right? It's it's certainly simpler uh, to just say, nope, you're an independent contractor. We're going to pay you, you know, 600 bucks to do this thing. And that's it, right? And then you're on your own and you have to deal with whatever you have to deal with. Having done that in the corporate world, I have seen, uh, I've seen that many times. And, and so a few of the Uh, criteria for defining employees versus contractors are who sets the hours for when you can do the work, right? It's one thing to say, I need you to do a programming job for me. And, and all I'm asking for is the end result. And you say, great, I'm going to do that for a thousand dollars. Okay, cool. And then you go off and you can work at two in the morning or two in the afternoon. It doesn't matter. No one cares. As long as you hit your deadline, I said I would have it done by then or whatever it is. Great. Here you go. Here's your thing. Here's your thousand bucks. Thanks. But if they're saying you need to come into our office and you need to work and you have to be here at nine and you can leave at five and you get an hour for lunch and you have to wear our uniform and, uh, you know, you need to write the code in this language using these tools. Right. Suddenly that's a whole different thing. Right. And and the latter is most definitely going to be called an employee. And there are some interesting things when you're a contractor that that happen. Uh, where you got to pay your own taxes and, and often you have to pay your own insurance. And I've seen it in contracts of corporate consulting contracts where I have to have a rider on my business insurance that covers me when I do happen to be in your office, right. To maybe delivering the final product or whatever, just so that there's, there's no, uh, there's no confusion there. And it's been coming up more and more lately, especially with regards to theater gigs uh, around here about you know, everything for a while was independent contractor. They hired, you know, hire a drummer. Uh, You're going to do these, you know, four rehearsals and eight shows, and we're going to pay you whatever per service. And, uh, and that's that, you know, but it has been changing because when, 
if you take a theater show and you say, well, you have to be here and the rehearsals are start at this time and end at that time. And you, while you're here, you have to wear this particular, you know, dress code. It might be theater blacks, right? But your dress is defined by the theater. Your time is defined by the theater. The songs you play are not your choice. You must play the songs that they tell you to play, mm. right? You can't tell people in the, there's often a, a decorum clause, right? Where they explain that you can't go up to people in the audience and tell them to F off or anything like all these things that are good and, and like would make perfect sense. Cause it'd be awful if the guitar player decided to play a different song than say the bass player or the keyboard player or the drummer, right? This is bad. All of this stuff needs to happen, but it also very much falls under the IRS's definition of employee. Mm. And it's, and, and some theaters have, have already moved to this around here uh, because they, because either they know or the IRS has come and knocked on their door. Wait, wait a second. What happens, what happens on Broadway? So if, if this is using a theater um, as an example, yeah. if you join a pit orchestra to play in a Broadway show, are you that an employee of, yeah, that's a good question. That because that, that's a great um, our Broadway musicians employees. So I'm, while I'm looking this up, I will tell a story. There was a case that was settled in 2016 uh, th that there was an orchestra where the musicians wanted to unionize, and the orchestra said, "No, you're you're contractors, so you don't get." Uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, you don't get to unionize and they, they got an attorney and fought it. And the, the courts were very clear about, oh, no, no, no. These people are most definitely employees. You know, you're defining all of these things for them. They have very little choice and no opportunity for entrepreneurial gain, right? They can't wear their shirt with their logo on it that says, you know, drummer Dave, that then maybe they could get a gig from, and you, you know, you can't hang a sign on your, on my drum set that says, you know, call Dave if you need a drummer, right? Those kinds of things. Not okay. Yeah. Uh, so that happened with a, with an orchestra. And then maybe two months later, that precedent was used in a case in Boston with theater musicians. And it, and again, it was a, a similar thing. The theater was like, no, they're contractors. And it was like, nope, they're employees. So I don't know how this works on Broadway and it's not entirely clear, uh, but I do, but well, but they're unionized, right? So I would assume that they are, uh, they are employees, but I no, could be they're probably members of the, of the, oh yeah. So, so they're members of the performing arts union, yes. musicians union. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the the Broadway show contracts the union and says the same with the same as they say, send over a lighting guy. Correct. They say, send over a bass player. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then they, and then the union, it might be acting as the agent there and taking the headache right. of, right. You're an, like you said, you're an employee of the union and then, and then it works this way. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting. And it also brings up like, you know, in, for example, you know, the, the wedding function party band that I play in, or even in your band, Right. Like, how is that different? I'm told when I have to be there. I'm told the songs that I have to play. I'm told what I have to wear, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, do this job. And, and where this becomes an issue is, first of all, the whole union unionized thing. But also, from an insurance standpoint, if someone gets hurt loading their gear in on a gig like this and doesn't have their own health insurance or, you know, whatever their, their costs go outside that, that scope. And there's a lawsuit filed. That's when this is going to come up too, Right. And, yeah. it, and, and the right attorney will say, well, this is, they're, they're an employee. This is how this is. And, and so there's some protections that, that, you know, a band leader or an employer can get that, the, the, the independent, con the person that has classified you as an independent contractor doesn't get and now workers comp doesn't cover it and all that stuff. So it's a really interesting thing. And it's, it's been interesting watching this sort of develop in, in the New Hampshire seacoast here is, as this realization, it started with one theater that, that made the switch years ago. And then one other theater made the switch and recently tried to switch back from uh, they, they had switched to, to calling them musicians employees and then switched back to calling them contractors. And there's some, some friction there. Um, which is, it's just, it's just an interesting thing. And it's worth understanding this point of employment law, 
um, you know, and especially it's, 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 um, likely beneficial to you as a, just a, as a hired gun, likely beneficial to be called an employee, right? You just get more protections, but as an employer, if you're a band leader or whatever, it it's it's worth taking a look at this and checking out to see how how maybe uh, this this should be done so that you're covered uh, in the event that you know something goes sideways. So it's just interesting. I, like I said, there's something genetically wrong with me, but but you know that not being said, I well, it is interesting. It interesting. It's the same thing as like you know the emphasis on who owns the responsibility for performing licenses and dealing with ASCAP and BMI uh-huh. and, you know, it's, 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 it's venues now, but you know, I think ASCAP and BMI is interested in getting the most for ASCAP and BMI and you know, the IRS is, as I understand it, they're interested in getting the most for, for the IRS. And so, yeah, um, right. yeah <laughs> That's right. I mean, but, but yeah. I, I will say this out here in Silicon Valley, the emphasis on using contractors, large companies pretty much make people go through a period of time where they're clearly they're clearly employees, right? Right. They're temporary, but what they do is they they go through temporary agencies to contract these people, and and the temporary agency, like you said, acts as an agent uh, who who takes care of payroll and takes care of of, uh, of benefits and those. Okay, types of things. so you, so in that sense, the uh, the the would be employee of say Google would for a for an initial period of time, Google would pay a temp agency a contracted rate. And then the temp agency would pay that person as an employee of the temp agency. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So it shields Google from having to take this person on as an employee and, and cover them with, with all the benefits that, that might come to a Google employee. But it also shields them from having someone on board that they're calling an independent contractor that's really an employee. Like that's the right way to do it. Just like this, this union, you know, agent thing. Yeah. I, I wonder with these things, and even with the BMI ASCAP issue, at the end of the day, do the original artists? So we're talking about cover bands largely here, or you know, even even your case in theater. Do the do the copyright holders want their music out there? You know, obviously you've written a play, sure. you know, you want it performed. You're, you're getting some kind of mechanical license for that. Um, you know, you and I've had this discussion that. It's interesting. The BMI ASCAP thing is different because the cost, how much, you know, when I play Brown Sugar in a club, do do the Rolling Stones actually see a penny of that? Or, you know, does that license that the that my club owner pays in order to have cover music in his club, you know, what percentage of that is going to overhead of of having an organization like BMI and ASCAP? I don't I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, but right, right. But I, I think What's fundamental, should this shift come and there be like a pushback from the government that musicians need to be treated as employees? You know, the the solve to that, I believe, would be some kind of lobbying effort by the industry that wants to see live music, you know, go on. Because clearly that would be the death of a lot of live music, right? No, no club is going to, you know, employ. Well, and put, I, but let me. Yeah, you're right. I, yes, that would be. But I also don't think that they need to, um, because as I understand it, and I am a both hack lawyer and hack accountant, but I'm not actually either one. So take my advice and throw it away. But I will share it with you anyway. Uh, when a club hires a band, right? Let's say they, you know, they hire Fling or they hire the House Rockers. They are hiring an entity to come and play. And you get to pick the songs. You get to pick how you dress, right? You, uh, within the confines of what the club needs done, you get to pick where your breaks are, right? Those kinds of things add more and more freedom and shift more and more of the control to you as the contractor, yeah. as right? As opposed to like a, a theater gig's a, a very different, like when I go into a theater gig, I, that to me, like I have very little control over what happens. I mean, I, I have to play my part, so I have control over that. But, but like the part is defined before I am even hired, right? Mm-hmm. And and so there's. I think for a band in a club, it is appropriate that it that is a contractor relationship. Now, whether that band should have their own insurance and the club should mandate that bands should have their own insurance and all that stuff. 
Like I've never seen that. I've seen that in every corporate employment contract I've ever, or, uh, you know, independent contractor contract yeah. I've ever done. I've never seen it in a contract with a club, but it probably should be there to cover the club, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, but again, well, then it becomes an interesting thing. Cause again, yeah. then it, it changes the dynamics. Cause that's an added cost. Yes. That a lot of these kind of like, hobbyist organizations, you know, aren't organized to do, uh, would it, would it self select that really the, would it be a good thing that only the bands who are like really serious about this and put their money into it are going to go out and do things like, like have insurance. Maybe that's a good thing. Be a real business. Right. Yeah. Like, so, but it's, it's a, it's a weird thing. Cause you know, you're really, <laughs> rock and roll is all about F the lawyers. Right. And right. So we're, right. We're really now saying that in order to purvey, you know, this art that we love so much, we got to be part of that system. Yeah. Whereas before it was just like, you know, just stand me up somewhere and let me, let me blare at you and let's see what happens. And let's see what um, happens. Interesting <laughs> stuff. Well, it, it is, it's interesting stuff. I mean, it, it the, the market, and mostly I'm reflecting the market is difficult enough as it is and going in the wrong direction. Agreed. Um, you know, so more constraints are only going to hasten that. And that would be a crying shame. Well, but would it, I mean, more constraints also add an additional barrier to entry. And, you know, I mean, I don't know, like that. It, it's hard. It's I, I, from my, from my perch now, great. Create the barrier to entry, right? Like I, I want less bands competing with me, but I also know that like that first gig I ever got would not have happened, you know, when I was right. whatever, 16, like there's no freaking way if insurance was mandated for this, like that's just not going to happen unless, and see if that were mandated though, then it would be potentially, let's say the booking agent's responsibility to say, Hey, I'm going to hire you. And for this gig, I've taken out a rider to cover you under my insurance policy. And I'm going to take instead of 10% of the proceeds of the gig, you know, I'm going to take 25% because I'm doing this other stuff that the law says has to be done, but that way we can stand you up on stage. Right. I mean, there's always opportunity and, and that's, I guess that's how I look at restrictions is it creates opportunity for someone who is willing to capitalize on it. And well, I'll tell you, there's a couple of gigs that I do that they've started to ask about insurance and I've said, mm. it's, you know, we've never carried it before. Right. And, but I do know a couple of bands who like mostly what they do is corporate gigs and they have to have it because it's, it's a constant there. Mm -hmm. But these are the, the gigs I'm talking about are actually um, public gigs, you know, civic concert series. So I started looking into band insurance and, you know, the, the one that the organization that um, I've been referred to more often than not, uh, you know, it's like five, six hundred bucks a year. It covers if you're speaker, you know, it covers, it covers the dumb stuff that you don't, you don't want to think about possibly happening at your gig. And it actually, you know, we play enough where it seems like that's a good investment to have. And, yep. you know, it makes, it's one less barrier to me being able to take, a corporate gig. Right. Yes. And so yes. I get, I get that side of it, but maybe a, a longer look at, you know, and maybe we should both do a little research and do an episode on, you know, here are some insurance companies and here's what they cover and here's what they don't cover. Yeah. I, think, I, I think that'd be useful. I, for actually, most people. Yeah. Even if you don't need insurance for your band as a whole, just insuring your gear uh, so that you are covered if, you know, when it's, because there's a whole different thing, your yeah, homeowner's insurance, right. You know, it may be covered at home, but is it covered when you leave and is it covered when you leave to, to be paid to use yes. it? Right. It's a right. whole different thing. Yep. So, all right. So there you go. The insurance episode comes up. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be excited about that. Right, Paul? <laughs> you, sh you should not be excited. About okay. That, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Back to your uh, accounting and legal yeah, profession. Yeah, I know, I know. All right. Well, that's enough. I think we've uh I think we've exhausted our our time with our listeners today. Thank you so much, folks, for listening and participating. Again, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Send in your thoughts, send in your questions. We obviously have lots of uh, things to say and maybe even a little bit of experience that might be informative and helpful. That's sort of the goal here. So that's where I, that's where we are. You have anything else before I uh, bring the band in, Paul, as it were? Well, we got to connect the two big thoughts for today is like okay. always be performing even when you're kicking somebody off of your stage. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> it. Right. No, that's true. Right. It's always be performing no matter what. Yeah. 
Huh. But not no matter what, because there's other good songs to play too. So. <laughs> See you next week. Later.